Hello, um, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, welcome everyone for attending this Social Security and Medicare webinar um, presented by Democrats Abroad UK. Um, my name is Rebecca Lammers. I am the uh, chair of the tax committee for DA UK. Um, some of you may be wondering why is the tax committee hosting a Social Security and Medicare webinar? Well, um, we run tax webinars throughout the year. And even though this isn't a tax issue, it's clearly a kind of financial issue. And we are very, very fortunate to have Jennifer Hershey from the Federal Benefits Unit at the American Embassy in London here with us today to talk about Social Security and Medicare for residents in the United Kingdom. Uh, next slide. Um, before we get started, I just want to clarify, this is not our normal tax webinars, but um, we are not able to give any kind of tax advice, um, nor do we endorse any particular companies or individuals. Um, however, you have the option to um, find your own tax preparers if, if needed uh, on the ACA tax return prepare directory. Um, and I think Charlotte will put a link to it in the chat box here in a minute. So great, thank you. Uh, next slide. So our agenda for tonight is, um, I'm gonna wrap up here really quickly so that we can get to what you really wanna hear, which is um, the main information on how to get social security and Medicare as a res resident in the United Kingdom. I note that there are a number of people here who are residents in other countries. Um, most of this information is going to be for residents of the UK, although I'm pretty sure Jennifer will try her best to try to steer you in the right direction for the processes in, in other embassies and other countries as well. Um, and then we'll go through pre-submitted questions after the main presentation. Uh, I have invited um, Betsy Atore from the Democrats Abroad Global Seniors Caucus to come and um, introduce the Seniors Caucus. And then we will close out with uh, a live Q&A of people attending here for any additional questions that may have come up for the end. But again, as a reminder, save your questions for the end, and we will share the link in the chat box uh, for the questions uh, for you to submit using a web form at that point in time. Please do not put your questions in the chat box. Your questions will not be answered if you put them into the chat box. Um, so great, I'm now going to hand it over to Jennifer. So um, if you could go to the next slide. Oh, and the next slide. So I, spoke, I introduced her. Great. I'm going to spotlight you, Jennifer, and take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Rebecca. So my name is Jennifer Hersey, and I'm the Regional Technical Advisor at the Social Security Federal Benefits Unit at U.S. Embassy London. So welcome everyone this evening to this presentation, and thank you so much for uh, Democrats Abroad and Rebecca for giving us this opportunity to explain our processes and application instructions. So first of all, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to try to give you a broad view of what Social Security means when you're applying from abroad, um, what the application requirements are, what the eligibility requirements are, how being in a resident in a country other than the U.S. is going to change this process for you, and also um, highlight some topics such as the totalization um, agreement and WEP, which is the windfall elimination provision, and then also Medicare, which we got a lot of questions on. And at the end, we'll open it up for, for more questions from other people um, if for anything that wasn't covered or you want more details on. So next slide, please. So this is just a very brief overview of what FBU London offers as services. Um, we cover the U United Kingdom, but also 16 African countries and Bermuda. If you're resident anywhere other than those places, we will not be your local office, but I've included a link on the bottom of this slide that you can go to to find out who is. So if you're not sure who your federal benefits unit is, that has a listing of every country worldwide, and you can look yourself up and see 
um, what embassy you should be contacting for that information, because not every embassy or consulate has a federal benefits unit. So they're kind of sectioned out throughout the world. Um, our office and other federal benefits will do social security claims for various types of benefits. If you're already receiving benefits, we'll do address changes, bank account changes, anything that you need to correct on the record. Um, we'll do Medicare enrollments or cancellations, or any changes to that, um, you know, part A, part B. Uh, we'll do a representative payee application. If you have a beneficiary um, who is no longer able to deal with their own benefits, maybe a family member or a close friend can apply to um, help help out and receive their benefits in their stead for their um, support. We will do social security number, um, initial applications, and also changes to the application. You know, if you need to change your, your name, your citizenship, your sex designation, anything that needs to be corrected on the record, we can do that. Um, and we are also your local contact for VA, which is Veterans Affairs, and OPM, the Office of Personnel Management. So um, if you have anything there, it would be our office who's your touch point, and we'll pass you forward if they um, need to help you more specifically. Uh, next slide, please. So here in the UK, we have almost 40,000 beneficiaries who are receiving Social Security benefits. Um, and those benefit types, um, you can see there on the screen, the different numbers who are receiving each type. And by far and wide, the, the biggest number obviously is retirement benefits. So workers who worked some years in the US and are eligible for a retirement annuity um, based on that. In addition, we have a smaller number of people receiving disability benefits, um, and that is because Social Security operates uh, as a 100% disabled uh, requirement. So it's not like uh, Veterans Affairs or some workers comp where you might have like a 50% a or, um, or lower uh, disabled requirement. So it, the idea is that if you're disabled and unable to work, then Social Security benefits could be paid out. So we do have a smaller number of those. Um, we also pay out spouse and surviving spouse benefits and also to children. So that would be either children under the age of 19 with some caveats or over that age, but permanently disabled. Um, and those children would be receiving on their parents' work record. So the average monthly payment is $780. I think that number is a couple years old, but it's fairly accurate. And the reason that's lower than the average benefit that you might see for residents of the US is because we have a lot of people who um, are under totalization agreements and other things where they work very few years in the US but are still receiving a payment. So, you know, we might see people with just receiving 10, 50, $100 a month. Um, and then we would have others who have a very robust US work record and might receive upwards of $3,000 a month. So we, we see a pretty large variety in that, probably wider than you would see at a regular US local office. Um, next slide, please. So we, um, just to, to go in a little bit more detail about those benefit types, Social Security does pay more categories of people than uh, DWP here in the UK, which is the Department of Work and Pensions. And the most, um, the biggest one there is spouses because there is not a spousal payment here in the UK, not in the same way as for Social Security. So for retirement, um, you can apply for retirement any, any time from the age of 62 onwards, but there's some more specific rules there. So everyone has a full retirement age or FRA, F-R-A, and currently it depends on birth year, but basically that's going to be somewhere between the age of 65 and the age of 67. And if you want to know what your fraud is, uh, it's very easy to Google, actually. Like if you, um, there's a calculator on the Social Security website, or if you just put into Google, you know, what is my full retirement age, Social Security, you, you're going to get some information and charts where you can look your date of birth up because it's as it's as specific as if you're born this month, it will be, 66 and two months, et cetera. So it, it does has a, a graduated um, over time. And if, you know, for people more and more recently, it's going to be 67. So you can, at, if you apply right at your full retirement age, you will receive 100% of the calculation. And that that's the point at which we calculate outwards from in either direction. If you apply early, as early as 62, we have some um, requirements. So if you are applying early, you're going to be applying for a reduced benefit, which means that the you will not receive that 100% payment that you would if you waited till full retirement age. So you'll be paid for a few more years, but we will 
apply a reduction and that reduction is for the lifetime of your benefits. So it doesn't change once you reach full retirement other than cost of living increases. Um, and also if you're applying early, there's a work restriction. So in the US that work restriction is based on, on um, amount received per month and it has a very complicated chart to it. If you are living out of the US, the foreign work test is what you need to look at. And basically you need to be working no more than 45 hours a month. So if you're working 45 hours or less a month, you would be eligible to receive benefits within that month if you are under full retirement age. And it gets a little more complicated with things like self-employment, et cetera. If you have questions about full about the foreign work test, and you want to check on it, let our office know and we'll talk through your specific situation. If you are applying after your full retirement age, um, up to the age of 70, we have um you can actually earn higher than the 100%. So that is called delayed retirement credits. And it's a calculation whereby um, your benefit actually increases the longer you wait to claim it. So it does plateau at the age of 70. So it's not worthwhile for you to wait any longer than 70. If you're 70 and above, you know you're, you know or think you might be eligible for retirement benefits, give us a call because we'll want to check your account and we don't want you to miss out on any benefits that you might be eligible for. For spousal benefits, um, anyone who has a spouse and has been married a, a year and is still married would be eligible for these spousal benefits. Um, if you're a divorced spouse, you have to have been married 10 years or longer and you would be eligible at that point. So for spousal benefits, you can receive up to 50% of what the other person would be receiving, what the worker would be receiving. So if you're um, if you're eligible on your own record and also eligible as a spouse, we would do a dual benefit. And that calculation, it, the calculation is complicated, but the easiest way to think about it, if you're trying to decide, if you're trying to figure out what you might receive, is to think about 50% of what the worker would receive at full retirement and 100% of what you would receive. And if that 50% is higher, then it's worth you having a spousal benefit because it will increase the amount you receive monthly. Um, there are some other restrictions relating to the age you apply versus the age the uh, spouse applies, et cetera, but that is a very basic way to, to think about that calculation. For a surviving spouse, it can be up to 100% of what the worker would have received. So in that case, um, some people, when their spouse is still living, uh, aren't receiving spousal benefits because their own work record is higher, but then when their spouse passes away, they switch um, to a dual calculation, including spousal, surviving spousal benefits because it's a higher amount. So it used to be that you could um, apply for spousal and wait for your own DRCs to build up. And there were some, there were some ways that you could kind of um, apply for one and wait for the other. That is no longer really a situation because of a thing called deemed filing, which means that when you apply, you should apply for everything, um, all benefits that you're eligible for at that moment. And deemed filing applies to anyone who was born after January of 54. So we're seeing that more and more in um, current retirees. Um, and when it comes to, to spousal benefits or children or anything that's reliant on a worker's work record, you can only apply once the worker themselves have applied. So you can't apply for a spouse before your, um, the worker has applied for their retirement benefits and the same for child benefits, unless of course they've passed away or in the case of a divorced spouse where the benefits are entirely separate. And these benefits do not have an effect on each other. So if you're applying for spouse or if you have a divorced spouse and a current spouse, it's not going to reduce each other's benefits or anything like that. They're independently calculated. For children, um, we're talking about children who are age 19 and younger, well, generally 18 and younger or up to age 19 if they're still in full-time education, and that would be high school equivalent. So it doesn't include university. Um, it would be sixth form here in the UK. Uh, so if they basically until they reach the age of 18 or until they graduate from sixth form, whichever happens later, um, or 19 is the absolute cutoff. Um, and so for that would be those age ranges apply for current children or also surviving uh, a survivor claim if the parent has passed away. And then disability can be applied for at any age, but of course has some medical requirements. And we would work with your NHS doctors here in the UK to get um, any documentation or paperwork to see if you qualified in those situations. Uh, next slide, please. So the eligibility requirements, uh, other than the age, which I've already kind of gone over, 
there is obviously a, a work time requirement. So QCs, um, which is the quarters of credit that you've worked in the US, generally there are four quarters in a year and we have a requirement of 10 years worked, which is 40 QCs. However, there are some exceptions to that based on agreements with other countries. So the UK and the US have a totalization agreement and as do many other countries in the world. So you, you can actually, on the Social Security website, there is a list of all the countries that have a totalization agreement. If you just Google it, you'll find it as well. Um, so if you're unsure if the country that you worked in has an agreement with the US, you can find that fairly easily online. And basically what it means is here in the UK, to use it, the easiest example, um, it's related to the UK state pension and the national insurance um, payments. So if you are, um, if you're paying, if you move here to the UK and you're working, working in this country, the totalization agreement basically says that you don't have to pay, you aren't required to pay both social security and national insurance at the same time. So it, it um, means that if you're living here, you would pay national insurance, you pay into this system. As a secondary uh, um, agreement, if you are then, when at the point that you retire, it helps you become eligible for either program, even if you didn't work quite long enough to be eligible for that program under the current, under the country's rules. So in the US, we require 10 years, but under the totalization re requirements, we only re require six QCs, which is about a year and a half. Um, doesn't have to be consecutive. Uh, so, and neither does that 10 years. So if you have worked for six QCs, but you have also worked in another, another one of the totalization countries, such as the UK, if you have that extra eight and a half years, in that other country, added together 10 years, you're going to be eligible under the totalization agreement. Now the calculation that we do for the benefit itself is only calculated on the US work years. So we're not going to take those UK work years into consideration when we do the monetary calculation of what your monthly payment is. It's just a way of getting you over the finish line of saying, yes, you are eligible despite not having as many US work years. And the UK calculation, obviously you'd have to speak to DWP about their side of it, but they also, are under the totalization agreement. So when we do your benefit estimate, we're gonna do it based on how many years you have worked in the US. The general estimate takes your 35 top years worked. So if you have a full US work record and you've worked there you know, 40, 50 years, we're only gonna take 35 years um, and we're gonna take the highest ones. And we will use that um, with the calculation. We, we will um, bring it up to, um, for inflation, we'll bring it up to current year standards, and we will also uh, use a thing called bend points. So we'll we'll per, we'll apply a different percentage to each section of the calculation, and that percentage is higher at lower income amounts. So the idea is Social Security is meant to support people when they have stopped working. People who have maybe a lower income work years over time will need more support. So there's a higher percentage for lower amounts, and that means that if you're a higher earner, it, it's uh, we start multiplying by a lower percentage. It's the exact details of the calculation are on SSA.gov. There's also a benefit calculator on there. So if you want to, if you know your work years and you have those details, you can actually put in the exact amounts. You can also speak to our office and we can view calculation estimates for um, if you're applying at different times. So if you're trying to make that decision based on, you know, should I wait until I'm 70? Should I wait for those DRCs to build up? Should I apply now at my full retirement age? Or, hey, I'm not working. I'm 63. I want to go ahead and apply now. And you want to look at how those numbers shake out. A good idea is just to contact our office because we can talk you through it. Um, the other thing that is a possibility is the um, my SSA online account. Now, we got a ton of questions about this because I know people have difficulty with it. But I do want to let you know that we do have people living here in the UK who have these accounts, who've signed up for these accounts and have been successful for it. But there are a few caveats. So basically, you must have a US address on the account. You have to have a US address. US address. Um, now, if you are currently here in the UK, but you have US address of a family member or you have a permanent address in the US that you use and are able to get mail from, you can use that address. It doesn't have to be your current residence but it does need to be one that you have some control over because obviously letters could go to it, um, coding for the account, et cetera. So you wanna make sure you, you know who's on the other end. Um, but if you, it, it won't be, it won't change your address for say IRS purposes or anything like that. It's just for the online account. 
Um, if you already have an online account and you moved over here and you've lost access, our office would very likely be able to unlock that for you and send you a new code by email. You can't change the address and other information, but you would be able to access it so that you can um, get that information about your work years and your benefit estimation, et cetera. So if you give us a call, we would be able to do that. We do an identity check by phone and we should be able to unlock those. That's if you already have an account. If you do not have an account yet and you're trying to set one up on mysa.gov, um, it the normal procedure is a U.S. credit check. So the authentication procedures that you go through when you set up that account are based on U.S. credit. So if you haven't lived in the U.S. very long and so you don't have enough U.S. credit information or say it's very, you know, it was 10, 15, 30 years ago and you no longer know the answers to the questions or the system doesn't have enough questions to ask you, then you may not be able to do it with that procedure. In that case, I would recommend a different site, which is called ID.me. That's ID.me. And this is a US government site that uses some different authentication procedures, such as passport in some cases, um, other ID documents, and even sometimes a video interview. And that is approved by Social Security. It didn't used to be, but it has recently been added to my SSA. So if you go to ID.me and make an account there, you will by extension then be able to get into a MySSA account. And that's a really good option for people abroad. We, we're seeing more people um, have success with it. Um, another option is we can bypass the authentication procedures on MySSA.gov if you have an in-person appointment at the Social Security office here at the Federal Benefits Office and at the embassy. So we do have the ability to do that if we verify your identity in person. Again, you will need a U.S. address because it involves a code being sent by mail to that address for you to sign up for the account. But that is a kind of last ditch effort. If you if you just really feel like you need one of these accounts and um, you're able to travel to London, that's one option. However, you do not need a MySSA account to sign up for Social Security benefits. It is not required in any way. Um, it's just a way to see what your work record looks like. So it's useful, but it's not required for benefits. To apply for benefits, all you need to do is contact our office. We'll make you a telephone interview um, and we'll go through the whole process with you over the phone. We'll let you know if any document documents are needed, which you would then mail to our office. We'll let you know in some cases, such as say a spouse who doesn't have an SSN, something like that, you might need an in-person appointment. But um, in most cases, we can do the process fully over the phone and by mail. So um, if in doubt, just give us a call and we'll check through it for you. And that's a pretty good rule of reference for all these things. Give us an email, give us a call, because if you think you might be eligible for benefits or you know, you're not sure if you fit into one of these categories, let us check for you because the last thing we want is for you to assume that you're not eligible for benefits and miss out on years of payment because of that. We would much rather you checked with us so we can have a look at your record and, and see what your eligibility is under the system. And the same for spouse or, or kids who are involved. So if, if you or yourself, if you know anybody who might be in that situation, you know, point them in our direction. Okay, uh, the windfall elimination provision. So this is, I'll, I'll give, there's contact information on the last slide. I just saw that pop up. So you'll get it at the end. Um, the windfall elimination provision is, um, or WEP as it's usually applied, uh, is colloquially referred to is a deduct, it's a reduction in benefits. And this is one of those things, I'm just gonna give you the basic idea of what it is, how it's done and why it is. I mean, I won't get into like, you know, there's a lot of concerns about whether it should be applied and things like that, but we're not getting into any of that. Um, basically, it is meant to change the calculation because of that thing I mentioned earlier about helping out lower income people. So if you have a US record where you only work 10 years, but you also work 20 years in another country, your US record, when it when we do the calculation will be artificially inflated because it looks like you're a low income person, when in fact you have 20 years that isn't even getting calculated. So WEP is meant to combat that, that's the idea. Um, and what WEP does is, it will be applied using any outside pensions that are based on non-covered earnings. Now, a non-covered non earnings are earnings that are income or wages that you're receiving where you are not paying social security taxes on them. So not federal taxes, social security taxes. So if you're paying national insurance, but not social security on your income, and at the same time, you have an employer pension or the UK state pension where, where that's being withheld from your from those 
wages, that is a non-covered pension. And that pension will be weppable. And if it's weppable, it means it will reduce the amount of social security benefits that you're receiving monthly. So the amount that you're receiving monthly um, will, will go down based on that WEP amount, and that will be applied over the lifetime of your Social Security benefit. There is, however, a max amount there. So, um, so for the max WEP for 2022 is $512, or 50% of that outside pension, combination of outside pensions. So if you have three pensions um, and you're receiving monthly $2,000, obviously using current exchange rates, you're receiving $2,000, Max WEP is 512, 50% of that $2,000 is 1,000, max WEP is lower, you will not be reduced less than that $512. If you have one state pension and you're only receiving $300, 50% of that is 150, max WEP is 512, the lower one is 150, so you will not have a reduction less than that. I know this is very complicated, it's a hard thing to explain quickly, but basically, there is a max amount that you can that you can be wept, and that max amount is is that five hundred twelve dollars. The calculation itself is more complex. It goes in and actually changes some of the percentages that are multiplied by your earnings over time. But that's the base amount: fifty percent of the pension, or combination of outside pensions, or that five twelve. Um, and WEP is, it also affects your spouse's benefits if they are receiving benefits on your own record. But if they're receiving benefits on their own record, it will not affect them unless they also have an outside benefit. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I feel like that's a very complex thing to understand. And I hope, I hope that was at least somewhat clear. Um, but if you are in doubt about how your outside pensions will affect your benefit and you want an actual calculation, we can do a basic calculation in our office for how how that would, or at least give you a little more of an idea over the phone or on email um, for your specific situation. Um, to just for the basic application process for social security, um, you can do that through a telephone interview with our office. You can do it up to four months before you want to receive, start receiving benefits. Um, and the documents will be sent to London rather than to the US. If you apply online, very likely your application will also still end up in our office for confirmation of identity or getting documentation or anything like that. The only ones that don't come to us are very, very straightforward ones where they check where they check everything online and you just check out completely. But otherwise, it's it's going to end up coming to our London office um, as we are the local office for anyone living in this country. So um, okay, so I think that's everything in that section. So I guess next slide, please. So on to another complex topic, which is Medicare. We got a ton of questions on this. Um, this slide has a listing of the four sections of Medicare. Section C and D don't really apply while abroad. You are only eligible for part A and B if living outside the US. So you can mostly ignore those. If you had those and you moved outside the US, they're gonna be terminated once you, you know, when you move abroad. Um, part A is the free portion, and that will, um, there's no, I mean, I, we'd recommend that everyone sign up for Part A because there's there's no detraction for it. If you happen to be in the U.S., you might be able to use it. If you never are there, obviously it's not going to apply, but there's no cost to you. Part B, for 2023, they've released the new amounts, and it's 164.90 for 2023, and that's actually a reduction from 2022. Uh, of about $5. This is the first time in my recent memory that it's gone down and that's obviously cost of living related, but um, but that is the new number for next year and that's a monthly premium. Um, you are eligible for Medicare. It does not, it does not fall under the totalization agreement. So in order to be eligible for Medicare, you must have the 10 years of work or you must have a spouse who has 10 years of work. If you have less than that, you are not going to be eligible while living outside of the U.S. If you are in the U.S. and you have less than 10 years, there are other options. There's a thing called premium high that's um, residence and citizenship based that you can apply for. You're going to pay a much higher premium, but it is possible. If So if you're over here and you don't have the 10 years and you're worried about it, but you know you're going to move back to the U.S. in the future, 
you can apply once you get there. You have about seven months and you can apply when you, um, once you're there and your eligibility starts. But if you're currently living abroad, it's not possible unless you meet that 10 years. Um, there are three enrollment periods. Um, there's no auto enrollment for Medicare while you're, when you have a foreign address on your, on your account. So in the US, they will auto enroll in Medicare. And in some cases we see it if someone has a US address on their account, but that doesn't happen abroad because the assumption is not that you will automatically meet it. So we don't wanna start charging you. Um, the initial enrollment period is a seven month period and your birthday, your 65th birthday is in the middle of that. So basically um, you have three months after you turn 65 for that general, uh, for that initial enrollment period. It's uh, four months before and sorry, three months before and three months after. So, so that window to apply for it um, is the initial enrollment period. And you can just contact our office at that time. And if you are already receiving benefits, it's a sim it's just a form. It's a CMS 40B. If you are not yet receiving benefits, then it's a telephone interview to get you set up on the system and everything. Um, that's just because you won't have the account set up yet. If you miss your initial enrollment period, there's a general enrollment period once yearly. It's from January 1st to March 31st each year. And then the actual Medicare uh, coverage starts in July. Um, however, if you're applying during the general enrollment period, it's very possible you'll be subject to the Medicare penalty. So there's a 10% rolling penalty that for every year that you could have applied for Medicare and were not eligible. Now that key point is the is the eligibility bit though, because if you weren't eligible, say, say you didn't have 10 years and then you somehow ended up with one more work year and became suddenly eligible, we're not gonna penalize you for those years that you were not eligible. You couldn't have applied, so there's no penalty. Um, however, if you turn 65 and then apply, you know, at 67 or something, there's a penalty for those two years. The biggest exception to that penalty is related to um, a group health plan. So in the States, this would be a group health plan covered by your employer, um, you know, health insurance of some kind. Here in the UK, in some situations, the NHS does apply. However, because the wording of the, the law is related to employer health plan, you must be working for this NHS um, exception to apply. So if you are still working and you pass 65, you are going to be able to apply for this exemption and you can then apply during the special enrollment period. Special enrollment period is any time of year and it's basically once you hit eligibility. So you, ha you, have, um, you have to sign up within seven months of stopping work. So that's you, there's a kind of grace period in, tied in there and, um, and you would fill in a form and your employer would sign a form stating that you were working during that time period. In the US, they would be confirming that you had health insurance, but obviously here, um, health insurance not happening. So in most cases, so it would be more that they are just confirming that you're employed during that time period. And we would then put you through under coverage by the NHS. Now, I um, it gets a little secure with things like self-employment and stuff. So if you're not sure about your situation, give us a call and we can talk through it with you. Um, but in most cases, that form would have to be signed uh, to, to show that period of work. And then we would put you through under the special enrollment period and you would be have an exception to that penalty. Um, and let's see, and there are the form for employers to sign is the CMS L564, if you want to Google it. For can Medicare cancellation, um, that's also just a form that's mailed to our office. If you are, let's see, uh, I think that's, I think that's the basics for Medicare, really. Um, the the thing that we, a lot of people ask was, should I apply for Medicare if I'm abroad? And honestly, we can't tell you the answer to that. It does have to be a personal decision. But if you think about it this way, you know, uh, it's a monthly fee. You're going to get part A is free. So you can get part A no matter what. But um, the part B is a monthly fee and you'll you'll have the opportunity to use that if you're in the US. So it's not going to cover you for any medical care outside of the United States. So if you are a person who lives in the UK and has no plans to travel back to the US at all, then in general, yes, our office would say you don't have a particular reason for it. Um, and that's, you know, that just, that's fine. 
But if you are traveling to the US a lot and you think you're going to use it, if you, you know, some people spend half, you know, two or three, pardon me, two or three months there during the year. Um, in that case, yeah, you might find that it is useful for you. And so you might want to apply. And you just have to think through your decision and the amount of money that it's going to cost you over time. I mean, another consideration is if you know you're going to move back to the States in two years and you're not going to be eligible for the special enrollment, you need to think about two years worth of penalties versus two years worth of um, annual, you know, uh, monthly payments. And that's completely up to you. But, you know, if you're unsure about facts of the situation, you know, of course, we can always walk you through that. Um, spouses, I think I said this, but spouses are also eligible. Like if, if you as a spouse don't have the 10 full work years, but your spouse does, you can also apply on their record. So, um, for, for Medicare, that's an option. So maybe you are not applying for benefits on their record because you haven't, you know, enough in your work record, but you don't have the 10 years. Um, you might apply just for Medicare. Um, okay. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the contact information. I know somebody asked about it earlier. The email is fbu.london at ssa.gov. We're currently um, we're currently responding to emails within five set five to ten working days. I'd say we'd ask that people don't send a second email until ten working days have passed. Just because if you do, it often gets assigned to a different person, and it just it just um, kind of mixes up the situation. Um, we we have pretty much caught up with the email backlog that existed during the pandemic. And um, we are seeing emails going out much quicker than previously. We also are encouraging that if you send an email, please send all your contact information because in some cases it's easier to talk to you. So if you send your phone number and um, make sure you put your full name, your if you don't wanna put your social security number or your last four, we'd recommend putting like your date of birth so we can find you in the system and actually give you very specific advice for your actual record, as opposed to um, just generalized advice. Um, in some cases, you know, every so often we see someone says they've sent several emails and just none of them are getting through our system. We do have a very robust spam filter. So sometimes things get bounced out that shouldn't. So if you're having trouble with one email address, you think I, I literally, it's been, it's been, you know, a month, no one's replied to me. I've sent multiple emails. Try, try sending it from a different email address or, you know, try changing up your wording or something. Cause it may just be that it's been caught in, in our spam filter. Um, we get a lot of spam emails. So it's it's just necessary that we have that. Uh, the embassy website has a lot of information. That's our federal benefits address on there. And also the social security website as well has a lot of publications and you know, obviously not all of it's tailored towards international, but there is still quite a lot of information there that can be helpful. Um, our phone number uh, is open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays from 10 to one we get an incredible volume of calls and we only have, I think we hold five on hold on the line. We found if we hold more than that, it just gets really like, that's how many the embassy system holds. So if it if there are already five on hold, it will bounce you out and tell, tell you that we're not available. We always have our phone lines open these three days from 10 to one. The only day we are closed out of those is the last Thursday of the month, which is a training day. But every every other normal weekday, as long as it's not a US or a UK federal holiday, those phone lines are open and people are, there are multiple people on the phone. So um, if you're getting bounced out, please, please try again. Um, the only thing we can say is just keep trying. We get people, you know, we get people who say they've called and called and haven't gone through. And then we get other people who we hear from, you know, they called several times within a day. So I think it really is just a matter of what moment you happen to call and, and um, how many people are on hold at any given time. Um, if you, um, that that is the best way, that's the best way to contact us though, out of uh, those options. And I think that's everything. So I'm not sure how much time, how we're doing for time. We're, we're a little over, um, but I think we'll, we'll try to make it up. Um, are you, are you okay for time to run over yeah, a little I'm bit? Yeah, I'm fine, not a problem. Okay. Um, I think what I'll do is I have a few questions that I'm going to ask. 
Um, but we're, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break from talking so much. Um, so I'll ask you a few questions. Um, I know that people are eager to ask questions. Um, do keep in mind that there are over 150 people on this webinar. We're not going to be able to get to everyone's questions. And this is one of the reasons why we've invited Jennifer to be able to come and talk and give an overview. Um, but you will be able to email and call um, the FBU in order to get any kind of more detailed personal questions. So um, I am going to share the link for you to pre uh, to submit questions, but we're not going to take them for another about 10, 15 minutes. But I'm going to give you some time to submit those questions while I'm talking to Jennifer, and then we're going to do a little bit of a, a Democrats Abroad um, PSA. So. Uh, Charlotte has shared the link in the chat box, so go ahead and submit your questions, but do, uh, as a reminder, we're not going to be able to get to everyone's questions, and I will be going through and trying to select uh, the questions that are going to be relevant to the largest group of people who are attending the webinar. So um, some of the questions um, that were pre-submitted um, that I just wanted to kind of go into a little bit more detail with you, Jennifer, now is... Um, is it, if you are living in the UK and you're receiving Social Security, is the Social Security paid into a US bank account or a UK bank account? How, how does that work? Oh, yes, sorry. Um, so either one, um, you, can, you can continue to pay it into a US account if that's your preference, or we can pay into a foreign account, but it has to be local currency. So if you're paying into an account in the UK, it must be a pound account. And we... The money is transferred altogether to our account, which is in Citibank Ireland, and it's then transferred as a domestic transfer to your UK account. So you won't see it as um, an international transfer or anything. There shouldn't be any fees relating to it. It's just the bank exchange rate on the day. So if you're being paid into a, a UK or other foreign account, you will see a variance each month depending on the current exchange rate. And is there like a standard uh, exchange rate? Um... Or like, is it better for it to be paid into a U.S. account or a U.K. account or? Um, it's, it's not better or worse. I mean, it's based on your situation. We'd say if you're going to use it in pounds, you might as well pay it into your U.K. bank account because you're likely to pay more fees when transferring it, you know, in your own account and things like that than, than you will just receiving it. Um, I mean, we're literally we're literally transferring a large sum of money over and the bank is just using the day's exchange rate. We're not passing any fees on to you. So it should be as, as fair as it's possible to be exchange rate wise. Okay. Um, and uh, you mentioned earlier about a link on the Social Security Administration's website about uh, calculating the full retirement age. Um, is there a link for that that we can share with people? Yes, I I could get it, but um, I'd have to, I don't have it on me right now. That's okay. I just I um, provide it I can, for you afterwards. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I just knew people. It's would more of a chart asking. that you can check your date of birth in, but. Um, okay. Um, and also, do you have to be a U.S. citizen to claim benefits? Oh, you do not. Um, so. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, okay. So residents, residents and citizenship both have. A, a difference on whether whether and where you can claim, but in general, there's no there's no U.S. citizenship requirement to claim benefit. There is also in some countries not a requirement that you've even lived and worked in the U.K. I mean, in the U.S. So if you're a spouse, if you're a U.K. spouse who's never lived there, um, because of the agreements that our countries have between each other, you still potentially have the um, right to claim. So if you are a UK spouse and you're married to an American citizen and they worked in the US, likely you can still claim US benefits as a spouse. And we would assign you a social security number, even if you've never had one, we'll assign it to you when you apply for benefits. Um, we'll do an interview, an in-person interview for that. Um, and you could start receiving. So that would not be true in every single country, but it is true here in the UK. Um, as far as like residents and things like that, there's also a tool which I can give you a link to on the embassy website. I think I might've put it on the slide where you can check um, your residence and your citizenship and see if you're eligible for payment. So there are very there are some countries 
where the rules for payment are a little stricter depending, and it's basically based on how many agreements we have with the US, I mean, they have with the US, but in the UK, pretty much it's always a yes. Okay. Um, and then is there any benefit to like contacting the federal benefits unit and the embassy to London uh, in London versus calling the Social Security Administration directly in the US? Like what what's the difference between um, mm -hmm. contacting in yeah, those options? We would always recommend that you contact your local federal benefits unit over calling the US directly. And this is because you'll get more information that's very specific to your citizenship and residence. Um, obviously, you know, it's a big world, lots of countries, the rules are different everywhere. Um, and so, although, of course, the US-based office will be able to answer questions, the reason that we have federal benefits is so that you can have people who specifically understand the country that you are resident in. So, for instance, we know how DWP works, we know how the UK state pension works, et cetera, and the same for other FBUs. So, we always recommend that first. In addition, we don't want you mailing documents all the way to the US and having them get lost and things like that. We'd always rather you deal with us directly so that um, it can be more cleanly uh, dealt with. Um, and our lines, I know people think sometimes our lines are difficult to get through to, but compared to the US lines, they're usually much easier just because of the number of people we're dealing with. All right. Um, and my last question I'm going to ask is if you're older than 70 and you just found out that you're eligible for Social Security, can then can you then back claim the benefits? How does that work? Um, in most cases, no, we will go six months back, but it's harder to go any further back than that unless you can prove that you contacted us earlier. Or in some cases, we might be able to use your UK state pension filing date. Um, but we'd have to take a look at that and see what your situation was at the time. And if, you know, if contact was made and things like that. So, you know, if you're over 70, get in touch with us as soon as possible so we can see what we can do for you. If we can backdate it at all, we'll always try to do so. But in some cases, it just won't be possible. Okay. It's six months is guaranteed. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to give you a little bit of a break now. <laughs> and I'm actually going to hand it over to um, Betsy from our Global Seniors Caucus. Um, so please do con continue to submit your questions using the link that's been put into the chat box. Um, and once um, Betsy and I kind of give our little um, public service announcement, then we will come back to um, the final Q&A for the session. So uh, take it away, Betsy. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Thank you. Next slide, please, Brett. Okay, so I'll give you a little background. In 1997, the National Democratic Seniors Coordinating Council was created as an official body of the DNC. And its main purpose was to give older Democrats a voice within the DNC and to make use of their experiences with Social Security and Medicare. Now the DA Global Senior Caucus mirrors the purpose, that purpose and provides a forum for all DA members to better understand the issues and concerns affecting seniors and more specifically seniors living abroad. Next slide, please. So we were established as a caucus in January, 2022 uh, we have a steering committee with 15 members and two additional subcommittees, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Next slide, please. These are, this is our mission, really, to support the goals and ideas of the Democratic Party and Democrats abroad, to maximize the participation of seniors living abroad in U.S. elections, to advocate on issues of concern to seniors, especially seniors living abroad, to be a voice for U.S. citizens living abroad, to support campaigns of democratic candidates aligned with the interests of seniors and to work with other teams within DA to further our joint goals. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have two committees uh, working, Medicare uh, Part B and windfall elimination provision, our WEP uh, subcommittee. I will just wanna tell you a little bit about it. Um, Unless seniors abroad continue to pay uh, Medicare Part B premiums while they are overseas, 
they will not automatically be covered by Medicare Part B when they return to the United States. Seniors who drop Part B and then move back to the US will have to pay an enrollment penalty. And we're working on this and we want the US government to exempt returning Americans over the age of 65 from the enrollment uh, penalty. And I know that Tony Kamins, who is the chair of this committee is on this call and she's doing a great job to get as much information as possible out there about this is issue of Medicare and we're also and she's also working closely with the Medicare Portability Task Force. Okay, the WEP committee is our other committee, which focuses on WEP. And as Jennifer explained, WEP is a formula by which the US reduces social security benefits to people who are entitled to pension benefits from jobs not covered by the social security system like foreign pensions. We feel strongly that the problem WEP was meant to resolve didn't consider in a fair and equitable way, the impact on overseas retirees and seniors. Over the past years, we know Congress has introduced several bills to repeal WEP. Currently, one of them, the Social Security Fairness Act, HR 82, has 305 sponsors. However, HR 82 has now moved to discharge petition, which means it needs 218 signatures for it to advance to a uh, house for a vote. So far, this has been unsuccessful. And we ask you, please write to your representatives to sign this petition in person at the clerk's desk and get it to a floor vote for this session of Congress. So our other priorities are taxation, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, elections, accessibility, and voting rights, including uh, getting out the vote. And please email us. There's the uh, the email seniors caucus at democratsabroad.org. And we'd be happy uh, to include you in committees if you're interested. Uh, and we don't give personal uh, kind of, we don't solve personal problems, but certainly uh, if you have issues, please write to us. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, I'm just going to tell everyone here a little bit about the um, tax committee. So next slide. Um, so uh, I've seen a number of tax questions. We don't have anybody here to give any kind of tax advice here today, um, but just to kind of tell you a little bit about the work that the Democrats Abroad um, Taxation Task Force does is um, we recognize um, there is a whole raft of tax problems that Americans abroad face. And so we are constantly um, speaking to members of Congress uh, in order to change uh, the tax, law, tax laws to make them more for fair and equitable for Americans abroad. Uh, next slide. Um, today, I'm very, very proud to announce that uh, we have released the 2022 Tax and Financial Access Report for Americans Abroad. Um, some of you here may have uh, participated in the survey that we conducted earlier in the year, and the report is based on the survey results. Um, we had uh, just under 7,000 people participate in this survey. Um, this is helping us then help educate Congress about the problems that we experience so that they're aware. Um, and uh, Charlotte has just put the link in the chat box so please go check it out and uh, let us know what you think of the report. Um, we're, uh, next slide. Um, so for those of you that are wondering, um, this is kind of our last in the series of webinars that we're hosting for this year. Um, the other um, webinars we've done have all been tax-based, um, but you do have the option to buy a recording if you want to. Um, all, all of the recordings are $7.50 um, $7 because uh, we, we're an American organization, so we accept in dollars, but um, you can very much use a UK debit or credit card and um, make payment on the website in order to um, donate um, $7.50 for each of the recordings. Um, and then we'll email you the link once that's done. Uh, next slide. Um, really, really important, if there are any Georgia voters here, um, please be sure to vote in the runoff election. Um, of overseas uh, Georgia voters uh, should go to that website link 
um, to make sure that the runoff ballot has been both received and accepted. Um, really, really super important uh, in this year. So please be sure to contact GOTV at democratsabroad.org.uk if you have any problems or questions with voting. Uh, next slide. Five things that you can do to help um, with our American abroad issues. Um, number one thing you can do is vote in US elections. Um, so hopefully all of you did that this year. Um, the other thing you can do if you're not already a member of Democrats Abroad, you can join, um, it's totally free. Uh, you can also donate and you can also sign up for our um, mailing list for the UK, you send us an email at textcom at democratsabroad.org.uk. Um, if you're outside of the UK, um, and also if you're in the UK, you can also sign up for the global tax mailing list, um, and the link is on the screen. Um, you can also help volunteer and help us to um, make sure that we can support any reforms or changes. Uh, next slide. Okay, great. So now we're going to get to the grand finale. I will do my best to try to get through as many of the Q&A questions as possible. So I'm going to um, bring Jennifer back um, somehow. So hopefully you had a little bit of a, a rest there. Um, <laughs> so I just, uh, my first question I'm going to ask, because um, th there's been a few people who have asked this, so I just want to make sure that we're 100% clear. Um, does Medicare cover medical expenses outside of the U.S.? It does not. It's, it can only be used for um, medical expenses within the United States. And of course, then there are various rules depending on location and doctor and those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Um, um, before before you do another question, I just thought I'd say yeah. um, from a taxation perspective, the only answer that I can give is that social security benefits, we will not withhold US tax from them. Um, under the US-UK tax treaty, they are taxed based on residents. So if you're resident in the UK, it is up to um, HMRC to tax them and you'd have to let them know um, US tax would not be payable on them if you're resident here. And that's regardless of citizenship. So um, it would also not create a tax filing requirement for a non-citizen spouse who did, didn't previously have one. Thank you for That's clarifying kind of the end that. Of our tax information because everything else is IRS. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Great. Yeah. No, thank you for clarifying that. That's really helpful. Um, so there are a few people that are still a little confused about the penalty for delaying the sign up of Medicare. Um, so can this be avoided by signing up for part A as soon as you're eligible and then including part B when you need it? Or do you need to sign up for part B immediately or incur the penalty? Yeah, it's it's part B specific. So part A doesn't have any bearing on the penalty on the penalty. It's only if you if you haven't signed up for part B, you will incur it if you sign up at a later date and are not eligible under a special enrollment period. Okay. Um how are non-U.S. spouses handled in the benefit calculations? And um, if you think that the calculation has been incorrect, how do you correct it? Um, yeah, so the calculation is the same for a non-citizen as for a citizen spouse. It's that 50% of the full retirement age amount, but the reduction, they could have a reduction based on age. So um, if they if the non, if the spouse even if you're, um, if the worker applied at 65, but the spouse applied at a younger, then they wouldn't receive the full 50% because they'd have an age reduction and they would be subject to the same rules about work um, as, as anyone else. If they apply over full retirement, DRCs are not applied to spouses. So DRCs are only for retirement people, um, workers. Um, so if you are applying as a spouse, there's no benefit to waiting after full retirement age. And that is true for non-citizen or citizen. Does, we don't draw a line there. Um, there were a few people asking, um, saying that they've just started, uh, just enrolled in Medicare, um, but there's no info as to where they should pay. Um, so how do they find where to make payment? Right. So if you are receiving benefits, the payment will be taken directly from your benefit amount. It's just withheld before you even get the payment. If you are not receiving benefits yet, you should receive documentation from Medicare directly, not from Social Security, but Medicare should send you a letter 
with a with a payment amount. You can set up online payments for them, or you can uh, you know pay by check or you know various other. Um, but we wouldn't get involved in that. We only do the enrollment, and we we deal with payment if it's if you're already receiving benefits. But if you are if you have not received a letter from Medic, if you're if you've applied for Medicare, you're not receiving benefits. You know you need to pay. Um, and we're talking about Part B here. Um, and you haven't received any documentation. You need to contact Medicare directly. So Medicare.gov would be the website for that. Okay. Um, and then, is there a minimum number of hours one needs to be working for an employer in the UK? in order for the NHS to count as a group insurance? Um, um, there isn't, as long as the employer, I mean, the, the form does not say full-time or anything like that, but I would take a look at the form. Maybe if you're unsure, take a look at the form. It's the CMS L564, show it to your employer and make sure they'd be willing to sign it because it says something like confirming that the person has been, so-and-so has been employed from the period of, and you have to put the dates in. Um, so as long as the employer believes, you know, that, that they count as an employee, then that shouldn't be a problem. If you are self-employed, it gets a little stickier because for self-employment, you have to self-verify and we might ask for backup documentation, you know, on what your self-employment actually was or, or, you know, tax returns or things like that. So if you're something, if you're doing a self-employment where you, where you only, doing very little actual, you know, you're not, you're not doing as much work. It might not qualify. That would get a little bit um, more complicated, but for, from an employment perspective, we don't have a minimum. It's just, we need that form that has the employer certification saying that you worked those years. Okay. Um, for late enrollment in Medicare, is there a minimum number of hours you have to be working to qualify? I think that's the same question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I forgot to mark it up. Um, if I, okay, someone said, if I move back to the U.S. age between 70 and 75, can I then enroll into Medicare? I only previously worked in the U.S. for three years. Uh, yes. So if you worked a short number of years so that when you're over here, you're not eligible, you would be eligible in the U.S. for premium high. Um and that's that's a part B where you would you're going to end up paying a lot more per month. I think the premium high is like, I think it adds like five hundred dollars or something per month. I don't know the the numbers change year to year, um, but you would be eligible. And you have to be either a U.S. citizen or if you are a non-citizen, I think you have to have lived there for five years before you qualify for that. Um, if you're there on a visa or something like that. So, it, and you will if you were living abroad and you were not eligible because you only had the three years, but then you move to the States and you are eligible because they have different requirements, you will not be subject to the to the penalty, to the 10% penalty because you were not previously eligible. So if your eligibility changes, there's not a penalty. It's just that you are, it's just that the actual, uh, uh, the Medicare itself costs more because you're, you're going in on less work years. Um, so yeah, Google premium high, and that should get you that information on the Medicare website. Um, and that, um, you also have a grace period. You have about, I think it's seven months. Yeah. Before you, so you don't have to do it right when you get there, but I would start because the process, oh, I, it's seven months, but it's like three months before you move and four months after that's what it is. So you need to have signed that up for that within four months of, of moving to the U S so I would start that process as soon as you get there, or even when you know you're going to move, you could call Medicare or Social Security in the U.S. Okay. We can't do it in our office. Right. Okay. Um, and what does Part A of Medicare do for you if you're living in the U.K. Um, and you don't it plan on moving do, back to the U.S.? Yeah, it doesn't do anything. If you, if you're, if you really know you're not going to move back um, and you're never going to even be in the U.S., then it's not going to do anything for you because it both Part A and B are only coverage for medical um, expenses in the United States. So Part A is hospital insurance. Part B is doctor insurance. So both of those, if you literally are like, I'm never setting foot in the U.S. again, it's not going to do anything for you. Okay. Um, 
And there are a few people that are kind of like asking clarifying questions around like they have a non-US spouse and they had paid in at least 10 years uh, in social security. And they're just looking to clarify, does that mean that their non-US spouse is eligible for the spousal benefit or how does that work? Um, yes. If, if you have a non-US spouse who has no US connection, and we're talking UK resident, not necessarily every other country, but here in the UK, um, we do have an agreement and they can apply for benefits on your record. We will issue them a social security number, a payment only social security number, doesn't give them any other you know, work, um, work requirements or tax requirements. It's just purely so we can get them benefits and we'll do the interview with them phone and then in person to confirm identity. So um, they, but they should be eligible. Um, and I think someone asked about the calculation. If you're unsure about whether the calculation is correct, you can you can um, contact our office or you can file a reconsideration to ask them a social security to redo the calculation if you think it is incorrect. Um, I mean, our office can look at it for you, but we may need to send that upwards. And, and how does the payment for the non-US spouse work? Does that go into like your bank account because you're the US citizen or is it a separate payment? Um, how does that work? Yeah, benef beneficiaries get paid themselves. So if you um, if you are a, a spouse or if you're a child, um, it's going to get paid into a separate bank account. So even for a child, we want a bank account in the child's name that is just managed by the adult. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of a spouse, it should be an account, either, either a joint account with both spouses on it or an account with just that spouse's name. We cannot pay to someone else other than the beneficiary. Okay, great. Um, I think that is it. Um, that it is a lot of information um, that we have gone over here. So I know. I'm so sorry. I know people kept saying I was talking fast. I was trying so hard not to. It's just so much to get through in half an hour. It is, but I think um, the the message is really loud and clear that they can contact you, and um, there is there are phone appointments um, available. Um, so thank you so, so much, Jennifer, for coming tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I, uh, just my kind of last plug, um, for people, if you could please, um, send us your feedback on this webinar. Um, we're kind of looking at and reevaluating, um, how we're going to do webinars next year. So your feedback is really critical. Um, but please, please, uh, use the link in the chat box to send us feedback on the webinar. Um, I will be sending out a copy of the recording and also the slides to everyone after this. Um, so watch out for that email as well. So thank you again, everyone, and have a good rest of the evening.